Hello there, welcome to the new podcast by School of Surgery. I'm Keaton Jones, academic junior doctor. Today we're going to talk about abdominal scars. This podcast is aimed at medical students, foundation doctors, or anybody else wishing to learn more about abdominal scars. What we hope to achieve at the end of today's podcast is basic principles of surgical wounds. We'll talk about the common surgical scars in the abdomen. We'll briefly consider the scars as a result of laparoscopic surgery and also talk about some specific scar combinations. Now, first of all, a common question you may be asked, especially as a medical student on the wards, is how old is a wound? Now, it's very easy if the wound is completely well healed, as it's perfectly acceptable to say this is a well healed midline laparotomy wound. However, there are clues as to how old or young the wound might be. For example, clips or sutures are often removed at day 10 following surgery. Therefore, if these are still in sight to you, you may be able to say that the scar is less than 10 days old. Other clues would be swelling or erythema. A brief note on whether or not clips or sutures have been used. The advantages of using clips in midline laparotomy or any other extensive surgical wounds are that following surgery, they offer quick and efficient means of closing the skin. But also, if you have any concerns with regards to wound contamination or that the patient is susceptible to a post-operative surgical site infection, they allow you to remove specific clips quickly in the post-operative period to allow the drainage of any collection or infection. The first scar we'll talk about is the midline laparotomy wound. Now, the first thing to point out is that the midline laparotomy incision allows access to the whole abdominal cavity and therefore numerous and various operations can take place through this incision. It often extends from the subsurface sternum down to the suprapubic area. However, it's important to note that this isn't the only midline laparotomy wound you may see. There's also the upper midline laparotomy. An indication for this, for example, would be a perforated duodenal ulcer or the lower midline laparotomy. Examples of indications being malignant gynecological surgery or elective access to the colon. Next, we'll talk about a very common scar you'll encounter in clinical practice, which is the appendicectomy wound. Now, this first one I've got here is called the gridiron incision, which is also known as the McBurney's incision. Now, as you can see from where the scar is on the abdomen, this overlies McBurney's point, which is two thirds of the way from the umbilicus to the anterior superior iliac spine. The scar is often parallel to the fibres of the external oblique muscle and is an ob oblique in nature. Now the other appendicectomy wound you might often come across is called the lance incision. Now this offers a better cosmetic outcome than the gridiron incision and is often more transverse in nature. The next scar we'll talk about is following a nephrectomy. Now the one we've got here is a loin incision. Now this is frequently, frequently missed, the reason being in a, inadequate exposure of the abdomen on inspection. They're often quite lateral and only extend marginally onto the anterior abdominal wall. Now these are often used for elective straightforward nephrectomies. However, there are alternative approaches to nephrectomies. This might be a supra 11th or 12th rib incision used for um, extensive radical nephrectomies where there's uh, invasion, where there might be local invasion of the, of the renal malignancy. The other one may be an anterior abdominal approach. This can also be used for a nephrectomy. Next, we'll talk about the Cocker's incision. This is essentially a right subcostal incision, often two to three centimeters below the subcostal margin. This is the classic incision you'll see when people have had open cholecystectomies, which still happen today, often due to failure of a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. They also offer access to the liver and the bile duct system. The next is the double cocker's incision, which is also commonly referred to as the rooftop incision. This is essentially two cockers which have been joined up in the midline. This offers adequate exposure to the pancreas for significant pancreatic resections, an example being a Whipple's procedure. Also allows access for radical gastric operations and hepatic operations, such as hemihepatectomies or metastectomies. The next is the Mercedes-Benz incision. This is the incision of choice when performing a liver transplant, as opposed to the previous one of the rooftop incision. The next one is another commonly missed uh, abdominal 
scar, and this is the Rutherford Mor Morrison, also known as the hockey stick incision. This is missed because, again, the abdom abdomen might not be exposed adequately, and it often lies quite lateral. This is the incision of choice when performing a renal transplant. The transplanted kidney is, insert is anastomosed with the iliac vessels, hence the need for this incision which allows for extraperitoneal access. The next incision we'll talk about is the fan and steel incision. Now this is the incision you'll encounter in women who've had a caesarean section. This is again often missed if you don't expose the abdomen adequately by bringing down the waistline of any clothing. The next one we'll talk about is the paraumbilical hernia repair incision. Paraumbilical hernias are often supraumbilical and the repair is a transverse incision just a few centimetres above the umbilicus. Now you'll frequently see incisions left-sided, right-sided or bilaterally along the course of the inguinal ligament. Now these are frequently used for access and repairing inguinal or femoral hernia and it's perfectly acceptable to see, say that this incision has allowed access for a hernia repair. Now we'll talk about some specific scar combinations which can be tricky. So the first one we have a patient here with a midline laparotomy and what appears to be a small transverse incisional wound in the right iliac fossa. Now this is, could be the result of an ileo, a previous ileostomy. Now the potential operations that this patient has had, for example, could be a total colectomy and then subsequent reversal of an end ileostomy. This could be the case as seen in a patient, a young patient with ulcerative colitis. They may have had a subtotal colectomy following failure of medical management of ulcerative colitis, in which case they would have had an end ileostomy in the first instance. However, when they're fully recovered from the operation, these young patients often want reversal of the, their ileostomy. This is possible as a result of an ileal pouch formation, in which case the end ileostomy is then reversed. However, another potential um, operation this patient may have had is a pelvic colorectal operation such as an anterior resection where the surgeon felt at the time of the procedure the anastomosis was possibly at risk of anastomotic leak. In this case the patient may have had a temporary defunctioning ileostomy, a loop ileostomy. At a later date when the anastomosis has been proved to be healed this ileostomy can then be reversed with continuity of the normal bowel. The next one is a midline laparotomy and a left iliac fossa small transverse wound. Now this could be as the result of a reversal of a colostomy. The common case you might see this combination of scars in is a patient who's had a Hartman's procedure. This is often an emergency procedure for conditions such as large bowel obstruction secondary to a tumour or diverticulitis and its complications. At the time of surgery an end, end colostomy is formed. However when the patient is fully recovered they may want to have reversal of their Hartman's procedure, which means there's continuity of the bowel and therefore they're left with a scar from the colostomy. Now we'll talk about considerations post laparoscopic surgery. So the first thing we have here is a supraumbilical incision. Now these are often small and easily missed, especially in patients who are obese where they may have fat folds sort of overlie in the umbilicus. However, Common to most laparoscopic procedures is the umbilical port. This is frequently where the camera is inserted. It may be supraumbilical or infraumbilical. Now the common one we'll see in clinical practice is the laparoscopic appendicectomy. Here we have a 10 millimeter umbilical port, which again may be supra or infraumbilical, and also a five millimeter suprapubic port and a five millimeter left iliac fossa port site. The next operation commonly encountered is a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Here we have a 10 mm umbilical port, a 10 mm epigastric port, a 5 mm scar directly over the gallbladder in the midclavicular line, and finally the fourth scar is a 5 mm midaxillary line port just above the umbilicus on the right hand side. Now the final consideration is this angry looking wound. There are occasions when, for various reasons, an abdomen may not be able to be closed with a primary closure. 
An example of this would be patients with significant abdominal trauma who have developed abdominal compartment syndrome. In these cases, you may wish to have a delayed or secondary closure of the abdomen and you may see in situ what's called a vacuum assisted closure device or a vac dressing. Now when encountering one of these as a student it's important not to panic. You can just mention the fact that the patient has a vac dressing in situ. You'll often see the uh, tubing going away off the bed to a vacuum device. These, these days these may be portable and sometimes patients can actually go home with them. So just to go over what we talked about today we briefly mentioned some principles of surgical wounds. We talked about the common abdominal scars. We considered the scars following laparoscopic surgery and talked about some specific scar combinations. Finally, if you'd like to follow us for updates on further podcasts from School of Surgery, you can follow us on Facebook, you can subscribe via iTunes, or you can go directly to the website schoolofsurgery.podomatic.com. Thank you very much.